I think educating the uneducated consumer is, is such a tricky thing. And when I say an uneducated consumer, it is not in a rude way. It's, it's what I'm saying that these people have lives and jobs. They didn't come from an exercise science background. They like to come to your gym to see a smiling face to get the results of the workout. But when they log on a website and see an Orange Theories website, an F45s or a Metabolic, they see a kettlebell, they see a good looking trainer, they see some nice colors. Oh, look, the, the membership price is about the same and this one's closer to my house. Like that's how people are making their decision on where they're gonna try out. And that's getting your message clean and to the point is an ongoing battle and it, and it always has to shift. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome to Masters in Fitness Business Podcast, where you get to stand on the shoulders of giants, and today I have a giant coming from you from the great state of North Carolina. I have Brandon Cullen. He is the CEO of Madabolic, M-A-D-abolic, and we're going to get into that, but Brandon has an interesting story. He was a pro hockey player and then got an injury, career ending injury. And, but he was always into fitness, had been training some uh, players um, on the side during his hockey career, and then decided to lean into that and took it from just him and one job to uh, one uh, location. And now he has a franchise. So uh, he's gonna share with us today how he did that, how he took it from just idea, concept, all the way to having franchisees across the nation. So Brandon, welcome to the show, man. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah. And we just, do you want me to walk just kind of through that, that, that timeline yeah. you laid out for me nice? Yeah, absolutely. So start, let's start us with your, your hockey career because you know I have mm -hmm. a passion for hockey, so I'm really interested in that. So, and then the injury, and then what led you to kind of come up with this concept and then run with it? Yeah, so I, I grew up in Canada, um, so I was fortunate enough to play in the, uh, the OHL, which is part of the Canadian Hockey League, so arguably, you know. Who'd you play for in the O? I played for the Oshawa Generals, and okay. then my final season, um, the Erie Otters traded for me for a, for a championship run. I was the uh, captain of the Oshawa team, but we were in a rebuilding year, and I was literally at the end of my junior career, and uh, Erie was going on a run and needed kind of like a similar player to me to complement their team. So, you know, it was great. Uh, arguably, it is the premier league in the world for 17 to 21 year olds. Um, the one catch is uh, it's treated almost um, from the governing bodies. It's, it's treated like a professional league. So I actually had to forfeit my NCAA eligibility Yep. to play in this league as a, you know, as a young man, um, which I look back on now and is kind of, I don't really agree with it. Um, you know, I never, I never got to go to college. Um, even from a playing career, I feel like I matured right where I would have been heading into college and suffered some, some pretty big injuries um, in those, in those young years. So a long story short, I mean, you know, I have two sons now, I may choose a different way for them to do it. Like I think a lot of people would, but also too, I think a lot of the ups and downs of amateur and minor league professional hockey do translate into more of a <laughs> resilient uh, kind of personality for the business world or entrepreneurship. So uh, real quick, I, I played four years. We ended up, winning the championship in that final year uh, where I was an undrafted player, but that run gave me a lot of exposure on a bigger scale that allowed me to transition into the New York Rangers farm system. So um, I never, I never quite got there. I played in the minor leagues, which, which is com I'm completely good with. I do, I do believe I was a minor league caliber hockey player from a skill set. So I played the majority of my career with the uh, Charlotte Checkers in the ECHL and then the Hartford Wolfpack in the AHL, just part of that system. But as you said, um, 
with my average skill set, fitness was that thing I could control off the ice that made me a lot more rele relevant come game time. So it was always a passionate thing for me. Um, there was no such thing as fitness as a sport. You know, I think if I would have came up now, that probably would have been a, a good angle for me to play. But I used my fitness, I guess I would say, to allow me to, to play a game I loved um, more so than anything. Um, so kind of like riding that, that, that wave into professional, I was able to play from about 21 to 27. Right. And I was up and down uh, between uh, between both leagues. I had a lot of injuries, too. Um, it seemed whenever I'd crawl up, I'd have a and we're not talking like a, a broken finger. It, it's like a torn rotator cuff or a mm. torn ACL or MCL, like big, big injuries that put you back six and eight months. So, mm -hmm. again, fitness kept me there. Um, I like to use. So when I was after my first year pro I came back home and some of the local players and teammates and guys that were in other leagues or playing in junior or playing college they recognized the fitness side of things they're like uh, my nickname was Cully so they'd be like Cully do you mind if we just kind of follow your training program yeah. And, I, and I know this is uh, just, just a quick just a quick soundbite <laughs> hockey players have the most unoriginal nicknames i swear but go ahead yes. <laughs> very true yeah. so i mean I, I know this isn't overly sexy but i was like well i should probably get certified and and should probably charge these people for it so it, it was that simple whereas 21 I, I i went through an online certification that took me a month or so to get through uh, <clears throat> and then i started charging players for the program I was doing for myself and half the time they were just training with me so this became a nice little passion and side gig in my off season so I, I would kind of do that and I, and I would bartend to make quicker money you know what I mean and, and my biggest goal was when I would go back to training camp that my bank account would be the same when I left the season before. Like my whole theory was on keep whatever money you made from the season before, just kind of like in that bank account at that same level and just creep up every year. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, um, so anyways, I was coming to the end of my career um, or I thought I was, had a lot of big injuries. You know, I was at my 27 year old when my body felt like a 40 year old. So I, I made the decision that I'm going to go see the world. I'm like, I'm going to play in a different country every year, play, uh, play in Europe. So I, so I, funny enough, I decided to sign a contract in the, the British elite league at the, at the time. And about a month before I was about to travel to the UK, the, the New York, uh, the New York Islanders called me, actually my agent called me and said, the New York Islanders need a player uh, that can kind of fill a role in camp. Um, they, they've had a couple people fall out and they just kind of need a, a roster spot filled with a, with a guy that's played enough. That's not going to be intimidated about maybe jumping into an ex exhibition game that could just fill a role. So I was like, shit, why not? This, uh, this will be my, uh, my training camp to get ready for the season overseas. Well, randomly I just had one of those perfect camps I mean I literally was playing great hockey um, probably the best of my career it just was one of these perfect moments where I was playing well the Islanders needed a power forward in their system I played my first exhibition game and on the flight home the, the general manager called me up to the to the front of the plane and said you know what, Cully, like, good for you. You've just earned yourself a, a NHL contract. And I was like, sweet. <laughs> this, is, this is great. So um, they said, congratulations. You know, we'll have you in the lineup tomorrow night too. And um, you'll spend probably the majority of the year in Bridgeport um, with the farm team. But we imagine you'll get 15 to 20 games in the NHL this year and you'll be a good part of the system. And I'm like, 
Awesome. This is great. Well, literally the next night in that exhibition game against the Rangers, funny enough, my fault, uh, my fellow or, or my past organization, I got a career ending concussion and I never, ever played again. Like all, all of that happened in a 10 day period. It was crazy. So like at the height of my career, um, I, I was, I was never able to play again. I, I did not know it was a career ending concussion. So like I did try to claw my way back after sitting out a year, I went back to Charlotte and tried to rebuild myself. I just could not get over the post concussion, um, symptoms that I had when I got into a very fast pace, blood pressure, pulse through the roof. I had trouble with my vision. I couldn't see the puck. I had kind of like double vision kind of thing. So, so eventually a, a neurologist that had been following my case is like, you know, unfortunately, Brandon, we're never going to clear you to play again. Um, that had to be devastating. Had, you know what? I'm sure the people closest to me, um, say I have an unhealthy uh, ability to compartmentalize <laughs> very, very well. So I, I remember being told this, and I remember before I even got to my car being over it saying, okay, but what am I gonna do next? Like it, it literally, I, I had this, for some things it's good, for some things it's bad, but I can flip and kind of pivot. Um, and at that point I was, you know, do I go back home to Canada? Do I go back to university? You know, what should I do? So I really did that classic entrepreneur thing where I did a lot of odd jobs for, for a year. And as I was trying to figure out if I could make fitness a living, I was doing everything from flipping houses to working, working security at NASCAR events, which you want an interesting job, try that one out. Um, <laughs> from a pe from a people watching side of things, I, I, I work the campground 8 PM at night till eight in the morning. Oh Lord. I can oh, only yeah. imagine. Yeah. Yeah. It was wild. So, but, um, I, I met my partner, Kirk, uh, Kirk DeWall, my partner today. I met him in that final season when I was trying to claw back. He was retiring. He was admitted, like he knew he was retiring. He had played 13 or 14 years and we just ended up in the same dressing room is the easiest way I could, could place it. And I had, because of my kind of relentless pursuit to be above everybody from a fitness side of things, I had stumbled on CrossFit about two years before that. And, you know, early, like we're talking 2004, kind of five era. Um, and I would just use it as like a finisher to whatever sports specific training I would have been doing at, at that point. So real casually uh he was sitting out with uh he had hernia surgery so we're in the stands watching a game and i said you know i think this this there's this crossfit thing i think could be big <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny to think about that now and and that's kind of what we did we we jumped into this crossfit world we were involved in the 125th affiliate um gym in the whole world uh and to put that in perspective i think we have about 90 in cross or 90 in Charlotte right now. And I think there's, you know, 20, 000, whatever it is. So it was early. Yeah. <clears throat> there was a, it was very disruptive. It very much, you know, fit our personality, but it had, it had yet to hit pop culture at all. So like your clientele was ex collegiate athletes, a lot of military people too, at that point. But, but, but to simplify it, it was um, highly capable people, had lifting backgrounds, had intensity driven kind of backgrounds and mentalities. And at mm -hmm. that point, all made all the sense in the world. Um, even the, the, the trainers involved, like our staff was four. We had a division two football player, a Navy SEAL, an Army Ranger, and a ex-professional hockey player very different than 
you know, I grabbed a weekend certification and now I'm going to call myself a fitness professional on Monday. So, Mm -hmm. so it hits pop culture and we start to have these weird, these very honest conversations, you know, why is our stay at home parents tearing their rotator cuff trying to do this or that? Um, Does the average human being need to be squat snatching? Like, honestly, let's have a real conversation. Should that be the norm? Um, And then there was uh, just this idea that because of the hockey background, we had a lot of different training that wasn't in the straight up and down, straight forward CrossFit methodology, Mm -hmm. you know? Multi-directional work, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the final thing ended up being we saw this massive, massive hole in the, um, in the industry where at that point you kind of had, you had like sports specific training, which CrossFit was rapidly becoming. And then you had like your, your YMCA style boot camp or you, you know what I mean? And there was mm-hmm. nothing in the middle from like a quality training for a everyday athlete pretty much past their sport that still wants a certain kind of stimulus, but sees there could be risk over here. And this is long before the rise of the orange theories, the F 45s, like all the big high intensity kind of boot camps. They, they weren't around. So we kind of set out with this idea that let's go build this hybrid in the middle of strength driven interval training, remove the barbell, be, be, um, be a more scalable environment to, mm-hmm. to, uh, to that 25 to 45 year old, um, high performer, we like to say, uh, and that's, that's just how it started. And, and it's weird. Like now we are a methodology. Like, I mean, we could teach the way we program and we're a top down program now that's instituted at all of our franchises in a very structured, very, I I like to say professional way. Like if you are in Texas today or Burlington in Canada or Charlotte, you're going to get a very similar experience, number one, but also a very similar level of coaching you'll be exposed to. So when you saw this hole in the market that you guys tried to fill, um, did you envision uh, becoming a franchise or were you just trying to figure it out and make it work at this one location? Yeah, we, our, our initial goal was to control Charlotte. Um, We had a very, uh, we had a good reputation as far as who we were in the strength and conditioning world, leaving the CrossFit world. So we did believe, and we knew we wanted to be more in the metro environment in Charlotte versus the suburbs. So the the goal was within, call it a a 10 to 15 mile radius of the uptown area, is to have somewhere between three and five locations at the end of a 10 year thing. And we thought we'd start with two in the metro area and then kind of branch out to the suburbs and, and kind of just make this, I don't know, 20, 30 mile pocket. It's kind of funny that I say this now because I look at franchising in a completely different way. We're keeping it a lot closer than 10, 15, 20 miles. Um, but yeah, I mean, it wasn't until I want to say six months in, we were, we were very aware that we had hit something just with how quick things were happening with all the competition around us. And that's when we started just getting into very honest conversations with people. Would you ever consider this in another market? Um, We would have local established gyms asking us, Hey, we'd like to put your metabolic program in our gym. And we're like, eh, I don't know. Not that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So we had a, um, we had an acquaintance in the fitness world that had a background um, or, or one of the partners had a background and went to school in uh, Virginia. And they were like, we would like to move back to Charlottesville and bring this to Charlottesville. And knowing the people 
there. Um, it made sense to then look into a franchise model and we, and we ended up hiring a consulting firm out of California that walked us through the process about six months, uh, building out our FDD, building out our systems. And yeah, I mean, that, that was the start of getting into the franchise world. Gotcha. So before hiring the, the uh, consultation company, did you have systems? How did you scale it? Uh, how many locations did you have before other gyms started approaching you saying, hey, can we put this in our place? Just the one. Yeah, okay. we just had the one. Um, but then when we decided to go with the franchise uh, route, real quickly, we pumped out three to four within that first 12 months. And that actually also, when you talk about systems, that woke us up to not having systems. Gotcha. Um, I think we're even a little bit blinded where we were so obsessed with surrounding ourselves early with type A kind of people that we were blinded that they were go-getters that figured it out on their own. Also with, with not a whole lot of guidance outside of us just being in daily conversations. And when we started to see what scale could look like, we're like, man, we, we actually have to put much more process into this. So there was a point in the franchise world that we actually just stopped franchising for over a year. We just said, nope, because we wanted to go back and, and trim up our systems and make them quite a bit tighter. Um, so it was just fig Yeah, I, you cut out. So you said it was just. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. But you said you were just trying to, uh, I think, figure out something. It, it, no, it was kind of weird. So like, I guess there's, there's two ways you can do things, right? You can build out the perfect model and then put it into play. Or you can, you know, throw things together, see what sticks and go back and fix some stuff. You know, I didn't even know the two models existed, but that's what we naturally fell into is like, okay, you've added four, two opened really well, two opened okay, what didn't happen? Let's go back and, tw and tweak some certain things. Um, gotcha. So we kind of grew into it. Gotcha. So you said uh, early on, about six months into it, you kind of started to feel, you and your partner started to feel like you were onto something. What made you feel that way? What, what were you seeing that made you think that you might be onto something? Um, so the one interesting thing about the CrossFit world, you know, is, is passionate as, as the community is, they do believe they're a bigger community than they actually are in the world. And there was a massive amount of runners, yogis, cyclists, triathletes, everyday fitness people that were not coming in. In the doors that were very athletic or the methodology just did not make sense to them. So all of a sudden now we had every type of discipline uh, in fitness that viewed us as the strength and conditioning component to their thing outside of these walls. So we had this concept of all these people that like, I'm a runner that I know I need two days of strength training. I am a yogi that wants to be more powerful in my poses. And then we also had the membership base that were like, I am all in metabolic. And you kind of all of a sudden now just had this, this, um, this community of like-minded people just all sweating in a room because they knew this strength driven approach kind of like really was needed in, in, in whatever they were doing. Yeah, lined up with their goals outside the gym, enhanced yeah. their activity. So they were treating it as a means to an end and not just the main course itself. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was real interesting where um, <clears throat> we used to sell ourselves kind of like as the complement to whatever your passion was outside of these walls early on. Mm -hmm. It was almost like a marketing strategy to pull people in and then convince them that they could drop that other passion that they were holding on to. 
because yeah. now like system wide, which is, you know, it's, it's a thing I'm very proud of. Um, over 72% of our membership system wide is on a 12 month unlimited contract, which is unheard of in the boutique fitness industry, like who we compete with. If you think of the, the orange theories or F45s, their big sellers are that one or two day a week kind of person where mm -hmm. our 75% of our people come four to five days a week on a 12 month unlimited contract. And they, their time with us is between two and three years versus months. So very mm -hmm. proud about that. Yeah. About so that. So you guys have people. a real slow churn. That's good. Mm -hmm. right, so tell me about this original location, like square footage, how many members did you have? How many staff did you need to serve those members that kind of, those kind of details? Yeah. So I'm going to say this everybody, but I'm not going to recommend that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> every guest on this show literally says that same thing. This is how I did it, but this is not how I recommend starting. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> So when we started, I mean, like, we had maybe three people and, and I just selfishly is like in this first year, when you come into a class, you're going to either see Kirk or I 90% of the time. Um, but we just, you know, it's, we wanted to make sure that this was going to stick. The, the, the reason I say you don't do that is that when you step away to scale, it can affect your membership, right? So, um, one of the most uh, engaging conversations I've had recently is we have a location about to open in Jupiter and the two guys opening it, like the one guy actually competed at the CrossFit games. The other guy has a long history and just fitness in general. They are actually opening where they are barely going to be on the floor because they can't wait to do location too. And like, just seeing like now more of the, business minded individual coming in and they're building a solid team so that they can scale quicker. Um, it's cool to see, you know what I mean? Uh, going back to that original location, we started out running a very small version of what we did. Do 15 person classes, thousand square feet, I would say kind of training floor, 1750. And then within that first six months, we had a first right of refusal on the space beside us. So we kind of just, as soon as it hit, we took on the whole space. So where we sit today is we run two different models. If you run a 20 person class, you need to have 2000 square feet of training floor space. And if you run a 25 person class, you need to have a 2,500 square feet of training space. So, it's kind of funny, I, you know, we talked um, earlier about this, but in this kind of COVID world, um, we set out this plan of training floor space to institute a certain level of coaching and training. We had no clue that within the time we sit today, it would benefit us so much because we are at one to two and a half times the size of some of our competitors running a smaller class which has really helped us out because I mean, let's, let's admit it. This is weird time. <laughs> this is, you know, and I, and I, I wish I could say we, we planned for it for a virus, but we really just plan for giving a client a certain experience within our door and, and through dumb luck, it's, it's just really helped us right now. So 2000 and 2,500 square feet, that's not a tremendous amount of space. So then your overhead has to be a little bit lower. How many coaches in a, like a 20 or 25 person class? Um, so the way we do it is but either, either uh, we can do, pull it off with one coach because the way we okay. teach people how to triage the room and think there's no barbells. Um, so we're using kettlebells, um, medicine balls, heavy uh, dumbbells, and... Um, different heavier medicine balls. We move a lot of weight. So it's, it's not saying that there's not weight there. It's just that the technicality of the movement. So, I mean, we will go up as high as 90, a hundred pound dumbbells and 48 kilogram um, kettlebells. We move weight is one of our biggest distinguishing factors, but 
if you look at all of our classes have five movements very structured every day and you either have four or five lanes to make this happen so if you think of like the parameters we always have 40, about 42 feet of width in the space, which gives six feet of distance all day long. And then we have 54 to 60 feet of length, which we can pull off about eight, six, eight to 10 feet of distance between. Um, so when we teach, the way we teach our people to triage or kind of like shark a room is, we have multiple kind of checklists we work with, um, not only how we look at the body, but also we have them break down the five movements of the day, the most um, risky versus the least risky. That will control the kind of traffic pattern that they will follow on the floor to make their coaching cues. So if you think of having two weighted elements, a lot of people think, wow, like, can you see 25 people moving safely? No, like you're really prioritizing five to 10 people at that technical movement and you're focusing hard on them versus like thinking of this, this big 25 person class. Because if someone is on, let's say a stationary bike versus a dumbbell snatch, you know, you will go to the stationary bike after you've made sure everyone's moving, moving the snatch well. Um, so it's just kind of like how we approach breaking down that room and systematically getting around that makes it doable. Um, on the investment side of things, you know, a lot of our, the investment arm, they're like, can we get this class bigger? Can we shrink the floor plan? And we're like, no, 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 no. Um, so I think if we were ever to go, if we were ever to go up, uh, we'd have to require more coaches on that training floor and then just more square footage. Yeah. Cause yeah. we want to be different, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just chuckling because every course that our program that I've signed up for, whether it's like a marketing course or training course or certification course, they have this formula that's been tested and proven successful. And yet everybody that signs up for it wants to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> and yeah. you're like, no, these are the steps. Don't skip steps. And it works. You know, so I was just laughing about that. So you, you, the name of your gym is called Madabolic, M-A-D-abolic. How did you come up with those? Com tell us, the listeners, what those components represent and how you came up with that. And then decide, and then, um, well, we'll get to the systems later. So talk, take us through the uh, acronym and how you came up with those components. Yeah, so the term MAD had been a start of the, the program from day one. And when we started thinking about branding it and what it could look like, so we came from originally a highly technical delivery on the work to rest ratios we were pushing. And to be honest, like, it's cool for you and I to talk about work to rest ratios and, and all the sciencey stuff, but you, you know, having like thinking about you're working with everyday people that don't come from a kinesiology background. Mm -hmm. So when we started thinking about the, um, so we have three different styles of intervals and we'll, I'll go into that, but, and right now we're working with about six different intervals within the three different styles. So call it 18 intervals, right? Um, the acronym, well, fuck it. I'll just, <laughs> I'll admit to it. We needed to find a way to talk to everyday people like everyday people by sneaking in some science. So if you right. think of our momentum, our M-based intervals, they are pace management intervals um, where you're, you're following a gradual build and in intensity from start to finish, going from a 70% effort to an 80% effort to a 90% effort. And we're always using a two to one work to rest ratio. So like that's a lot of information versus saying to a client, hey guys, we're doing a momentum-based workout today and that's a gradual build in intensity from start to finish. So you know, like, like we sneak in the science by the way we design, mm -hmm. but you just use, use everyday terms that make sense. Mm -hmm. um, anaerobic is our A. It's a one-to-one -one work to rest ratio, very basic and brutal, uh, heavy and fast, just as much recovery as there is um, work. And that, that speaks to people, that's your 100% effort. And finally, the D, it's an 80% grind from start to finish. So think of like in anaerobic days where you're doing heavy squats and deads, 
uh, for 15 seconds to a minute. A durability day, you may doing, be doing bear crawls, Turkish get-up variations, heavy carries for two to five minutes. And it's just an 80% grind trying to, trying to, trying to last uh, more so than anything. So through a lot of um, thesaurus searches, of the right terms to put in for momentum durability. That's how the MAD acronym became a living, breathing thing, which is real cool now that we could probably put shirts in our lobby that just had a giant D on them. And we'd have clients buy them and be like, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a D kind of person or something. It's, it's a cool thing to see, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. And what I really like about that is that you were able to, because a lot of trainers, the trap that they fall into is that they want to throw all the science and all the fancy terms and all the trainer speak at potential clients. And clients either A, well, A, they don't understand it, or B, they don't care. They're like, okay, but will that help me lose weight? <laughs> that's what they care about. So I like that you thought about crafting your message to resonate with potential clients, you know, um, cause I think that's a, a major hurdle for a lot of trainers that begin their own gyms or uh, their own businesses. Yeah. We always, uh, when I do, when we bring on a new uh, trainer, you know, they go through what we call training camp. We see, we seem to not be able to relate everything to sports, but we call it training camp. And it's like a two day, eight hour, both day boot camp that then sends them back home to be in their four week on ramp, right? Um, and we have a quote that we use in there is um, you, could, you could technique someone right out your door. And it's yeah. exactly what you said. It's like, you still, it, it just, just, just as important as fixing someone's foot position is saying hello to them and calling them by their first name on the way in the door. It's mm -hmm. celebrating their victories and, and, you know, giving a pat on the back in, in tough times. And it's having clean bathrooms and, and having a really nice playlist. Like, I think results keep people with you for two to three years. And that is a reflection of um, the program. And that's what allows you to stay relevant for a long time. But a lot of people on this that will hear this, we all know there's a lot of subpar products out there that do very well because they do a real good lobby game. They have a great lobby game. They're very mm -hmm. kind people. And guess what? When I got my coffee this morning, I go to this coffee shop because of the experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have the best coffee in the city and their people are awesome. And they say, Hey, Brandon, good to see you. And you know, that part of the business is not um, leveraged enough, I think. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, because when I walk into like a training studio, like when I was in LA, I visited Barry's Boot Camp, Soul Cycle, a um, couple of other places. And when I walk in, I look at the programming. I'm like, oh man, this programming shit. You know, why are all these people here and why are they paying for this and loving it, right? <laughs> because they don't care. They don't care about the program and they really don't. They care yeah. about the experience and what they get from it, how it makes them feel. So yeah. I, comp I agree with you completely. There, I think from a trainer's standpoint, you want it to be legit, right? On the yes. training side, but you have to pay homage to the customer experience because like you said, that's what keeps people coming back. That's what creates word of mouth creates that buzz, keep, keeps people members for two years, where I think um, I uh, talked to several people who were in, in, involved with Orange Theory at the higher level, and their churn is like six months. That's the average length of time that people stay with Orange Theory. And you think about that's a lot of churn and burn through the community. You know, I don't know, you know, and so like, that makes me think, can they last? But if you can get people to join for two or three years, 
that's a dramatically slower burn. So long term, it, it tends to be better for your business. I agree. So I'll go ahead. No, I, I mean, you're 100% right. I mean, like, I now view the the orange theory model as a they're, they're, they're an unbelievable guerrilla marketing program that that fitness is their is their vessel, right? They mm -hmm. consistently put 300 new people in the doors monthly that requires a lot of front desk staff that requires a lot of paid advertising but they're real good at at the volume game right i have personally have no intention going there i like to find the segment of high achieving individuals in a market we know at three to 350 members you start getting to a full facility because those people are coming four to five days a week and we keep them for two to three years that's where I feel good. And I'm not saying that our model's better because Orange Theory and F45, they're doing unbelievable. It's just, it's, it's where I don't want to go hang out because it is very competitive. It's a competitive space there. You know, mm -hmm. I feel better targeting a smaller demographic that knows exactly that, who, sorry, that I know or believe I know exactly who they are. I just feel better going after that consumer. So how many, how many at the six month mark, how many members did you have? Do you um, we opened up our doors with 42 because I'll never forget that we opened up on, I think it was 2011, um, uh, Halloween, October 31st. And what we did was like a, uh, which is kind of funny. We still use the strategy, but we did two weeks of VIP classes and all we did was we went out and leveraged the connections we had in the community of high performing people and businesses, complimentary, competitive, and even adjacent. So like think of getting a high end um, salon. Well, salon people cut a lot of people that cut hair talk to a lot of people. Hmm. Right. So we would do these VIP classes for different industries from restaurants to fitness to coffee to juice bars. And we'd invite these owners of the businesses or employees and say bring your friends and then we kind of offer a founding membership kind of deal and our thought process at the time was you get 40 people that are for lack of a better term kind of players in your market their their reach now reaches their people and you kind of start like infecting these little pockets within your community so like now we have a lot more obviously technical approach of doing this. And this is like one part of the, the growth, uh, the growth approach with digital, with community building, but that's how we started. And I want to say six months in, we were probably over that hundred member mark. And then we introduced a promo that we still use today, 10 days for $10. And it was, it was a way to entice people enough, but it also wasn't that first week free where you got coupon shoppers that would never convert. Like just that act of putting your credit card in the system and booking your own class, put a different type of person in your door, which really helped the conversion. And once we did that and actually started marketing it, we went through four months I think it was June, July, August, September, which aren't even in the fitness world, always the best of months. Right. Right. And we added, um, 30 to 40 members every month for four straight months. And we went from a hundred to like 240 clients. That just, it just kind of like that started and to use a business term that applies to you. That was the hockey stick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that yeah. was it. Okay. All right. So at that point, you figured you were um, you are on to something. So then you reached out to the consultants. Where did you start with your systems, with building your systems? It was more understanding the franchise model. The one thing my partner and I um, are extremely like um, OCD on the good side of things. So like we want everything buckled up. We want a class in Austin to feel like a class in Charlotte. So we always had the fitness side of things 
systematic. We just didn't have the business background for what is your item six in your FTD look like? What should it look like? What does you know, FTD what is, stand for? FTD, your franchise disclosure documents. So when someone says, hey, I'd like to franchise, you legally present them with this 200 page document. Um, that is the meat of the business. Um, and it pretty much tells all upfront costs, ongoing costs, royalty structures, termination structures, stuff like that. But it's just this meaty document describing the business. And imagine two Canadian kids with no, uh, you know, <laughs> no collegiate uh, education try to build out a 200 page FDD, like good luck. So yeah, <laughs> that's what it was. So they helped you build that out. So the, yeah. the business, the back end system, so to speak. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. But yeah. then you had all of the, the training systems, onboarding systems for both clients, staff, the training broke down, bro, uh, broken down from um, how to bring on trainers, how to bring on clients, all of that stuff already made up. Yeah, we had a version of it. Obviously, it's a lot better now. Like we we all get better at what we do. And, and you know, we've been in this 10 years now. So um, it's better. But we did have a version that when you are running two franchisees, and you can literally hold people's hands through every process that worked. When that now become five franchisees, oh, okay, we got to tighten this up a little bit. Now that we have, well, we have 12 open two opening in the next two months and 20 in development, that's a different level of systems now, right? So mm -hmm. that, that, that's just, it's just the systems have evolved, but the systems have always been there and we just try to keep evolving the systems. Yeah, so walk me through you and your partner. So when you first opened up, you guys were teaching 90% of the classes. Yep. When did you realize that um, you had to step away in order to, to make it really take off? And then what is your role today in the, in the business versus then? Yeah, I would say like three years in, we started noticing that um, the two of us were in every conversation and we were figuring it out because we're grinders. But I want to say you're doing everything okay than doing anything great. So we really divided our roles, which I think was one of the best things we did. And, you know, I have a creative side to me that I like to explore with our tone, our voice, the type of music. And Kirk is obsessed with the actual training methodology um, specific to really training people and on-ramping trainers. I also have this weird, um, on the creative side of me is like, I don't know how to explain it, but like I can see program design and patterns and, and kind of like mathematically where I can apply the right like 12 week structure to launch over a, a year to provide the right kind of variety, but structure. So like if you can look at the two of us where the structure of the program and the design, much of that comes from my brain that I can throw at Kirk and he's like, I like where this is going. And then he has that training side of things where it's like, I think we need to start on ramping a trainer this way. So like we've really divided those roles quite a bit, um, three years, or we divided those roles three years in. And now the business, like it kind of has taken an aggressive turn in the last year. We did um, strike a new partnership in August of last year to go after some real scale. Um, so my role now within the company is, uh, has been relabeled as the, the chief kind of concept officer. And it's more of like right now, we have a lot of brilliant people behind the brand that are taking my initial systems and making them better. You know, like I just had choppy systems that made sense to me on a, on a, on a smaller level and they're taking them to a, a bigger level. So I'm in a lot of conversations of where the brand is going. Um, and then Kirk and I handle all program design, all, uh, uh, launching of new facilities and the, the on-ramping of new trainers. Yeah. There's a, there's several things in there that I like and that I want to unpack. Number one, when you said you guys kind of decided to divide and conquer, I think from the people that I've interviewed and spoken with in the industry, that seems to be the formula for success. 
the formula for disaster is when both when two partners have the same role then it becomes a power struggle where you're button heads and then usually disaster ensues but when you can find complementary roles to play off of one another then it becomes kind of a synergistic partnership uh where the two become greater than you know than you know they you know, then two plus two equals three kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, two plus two equals five. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't say enough about Kirk himself as an individual, because like even in the, the early <clears throat> days where we did touch anything, like I have a very uh, dominant kind of personality of wanting a final say good or bad, you know, it's mm -hmm. just, that's just how I'm wired. And he has the right kind of mindset where, you know, he challenges me at the right time. And, you know, I, I can't even like, I can't even imagine even attempting the, the stuff without him. But he also had this humbleness about him that he didn't have to have a final say. You know, like, and like, I benefited from that, because if there was two of us in a room, like you said, no chance, that ain't working. Yeah. Um, or two of me in a room, that's not going to work. So like his unique, um, humble quality one of the going uh one of the going things about kirk is he very rarely says anything but when he does everyone's like he's speaking like <laughs> se my, my younger sister calls him sensei it's like sensei speaking right now we got we better all listen up so he has a very, yeah 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 okay yeah i like that um so his words carry more weight because they're yeah. so precious okay and then at what point in, in that timeline did you, did you guys step away from the training floor? What made you realize you had to step away from the training floor? And what were some of the consequences? Um, we, so uh, when I talked early on about, we made a strategic thing in that first year to make sure we launched correctly. We still had the other CrossFit business. Mm -hmm. But we also had a mind of moving away from it quick enough. So we didn't have this massive pushback. The other thing that was important to us is we set out to say, let's design the workout so damn good that someone could actually stand in front of the board and be like, you know, Brandon, like, he's, he's quite a, he's a prick. I, I actually don't enjoy him, but what a class. So we like focus so hard at making this, this class so damn good that we, we hope that anyone could be in front of that board and, and people would still get a great experience or a great workout, even if they didn't, they didn't jive with the individual. Um, and that's something like we'll pull our membership from time to time. We still get like people want to train when they want to train and they do follow trainers, but they also will heavily admit I'm happy seeing anybody. And I think that's a real good quality to the product that's hitting the floor. Um, so to circle back when we started stepping away, it was more when the, when the franchising side of the business started growing. Um, Kirk still, Kirk is, um, he gets a fire from being on the floor. Um, so he still teaches more classes than I do now because it's what he loves. You know, something I, I hate to admit to, but I can't do our own workouts within our class because of my head condition. Um, I have to monitor my blood pressure and pulse rate, and I really have to kind of focus on exertion. Um, and, and when I get into a class structure of having a competitive kind of personality in me, you know, I can easily push too hard without monitoring my rest and all that. So I actually, in a way, I don't know if this will come across, you know, wh wh how I feel deeply, but I don't want to be the face. If I can't lead, I almost don't want to be on the floor because in a selfish way, I feel like a poser. I feel like, you know what I, you know what I mean? And yep. like, I, I believe I was, my gift in life was to push and to see what this body could do. And I can't do that anymore. So to sit in this role as the, I don't like it. So like now, what can I push? I can push. Let's see how far we can take this business. Like, let's see the team I can build underneath me. And I prefer that being behind the scenes now 
on that side of things, if, the, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It makes perfect sense. So now you hire the um, consulting firm, you get your FTD. How do you begin to launch your first franchise? How do you solicit that? How do you market that? Who do you market it to? All of those things. So we started franchising in 2012. So for seven years, we opened 10, nine locations. And to be honest, we did nothing. We didn't advertise one thing. We focused on just opening good locations and enough people travel, enough people have friends. And that's how we got almost every single person that came through our door was a personal connection based off of what we were already doing. Now, you know, we have a new partnership. Our, our partners, uh, the, the, you know, the investment arm of the business is Z Growth Partners. They are true scale advertising machines and know how to do it. So it's just two completely different things where we did it. We were only looking at a slam dunk individual that we probably had a connection with in a market that made sense versus anything. There was no strategy, to be honest. Oh, I like that honesty. And it was probably, to be honest with you, it was probably good that you started slow like that, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, if you, it's like trying to, you know, restore your 76 Mustang and then entering in a NASCAR race, you're going to get your Absolutely. ass handed to you, you know, because yeah. you're just not up to that level. So it's better that you kind of start slow and earn your chops, so to speak. Yeah. And you know what we, before we signed our partnership, we were looked at by private equity a couple times and that's where we saw like what was behind the machine for lack of a better term from a F45 orange theory cycle bar type company. And real quick, we were like, okay, if we want to go that way, that's going to require a partnership. And we, this, this is how easy the decision was for us to do it or not. It's like, we will open 20 and be completely happy, or we can partner and open 200 and be happy. As long as what we put on the floor looks identical, I don't care which way it happens. And Z growth came to the table with the right kind of pitch that made sense um that that's why the partnership made sense but we also would have been cool opening 20 great locations over the next five years and that would have been our story that would have been great okay there had to be some scary shit signing on that dotted line <sighs> we were at the point in the business where we had the nine and thinking about getting to 10 and or getting to 20 or 30 and building that team, I actually felt more confident in picking the right group to, to grow with, as opposed to like, how would we build a team to do this? Where in a weird way, I thought it was less risky to go to 200 with the right team, then figure out how to get to 30 by building the team without that skill set. So it, yeah, I mean, like, you know, we had to give up equity, but we are, Kirk and I are completely happy with our life here in Charlotte and our corporate stores will always support that. So I said, you know what, fuck it, let's swing for the fences. Let's see what we can do. And he agreed. And now we're surrounded by people that are experts in, in this scaling thing. And, you know, it's, it's been a really cool last uh, 12 months. Okay. I like that. And so now you're all in on the franchise and you guys are growing like gangbusters. Yep. Okay. And Something so, like <laughs> so, so what, what is your day to day uh, life or responsibilities look like in that organization? Um, so today, uh, it's setting the tone for the type of company that we are, we want to be. So I'm in a lot of 
my role is the is probably the least definable because I'm right now in almost every conversation because a lot of Kirk and I systems need to be better for the next level of scale. So whether we're talking about a PR firm and the type of tone to take in an article, what our social media launch strategy could be, how often to have a training camp, can we make a digital training camp, like all those kind of things. I seem to be uh, everywhere right now seeing how the concept is coming together. Kirk has a much more defined role focused on the training side of things, but we also chose what we wanted to do. Not being able to be Kirk, I am okay with being uncomfortable and, and, and learning something new I could possibly be good at. Like I almost like that I'm somewhat not good at some of these new things that I'm learning because it gives me something to work towards. It's, it's that how far can I take this? You know, no different than when I was 20, where could I take this body? I'm like, well now where could I take this business? How could I contribute? So I'm just trying to redirect my fire into something new and competitive is, is, is mainly what I'm trying to do. Yeah. I like that quite a bit. It reminds me, uh, I recently started listening to Mac Miller's uh, last album, rest in peace, but there's a song in there where he says, all I want to do is the most. And I've kind of, adopted that philosophy <laughs> yeah. it's pretty simple what do you want to do yeah. the most <laughs> i'll give you a song to listen to that's real genius um the artist is hobo johnson and the song is called i want a dog and it's a metaphor for a guy saying you know i want it all like i want okay I, and it's and it, I'll, I'll be interested to, to hear your take on it because he's got a really unique sound it's like a hybrid of like alternative poet and rap all in like once very different but let me know what you think about that because it's 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 near identical to what you just said to me i love it it's been my yeah. theme song for like the last year or so yeah okay nice i'll give it a listen to all right well brandon thanks a lot for coming on and kind of walking us through taking it from not having a plan to be in the, the fitness industry to now having a franchise so congratulations to you and kudos to you for being able to pivot. So I always end with three questions and it's my, my favorite part of the show because we kind of get to peel back the curtain on Cully a little bit and we get some of the, we get some of the best answers. And I think I know what this first one's going to be, but I'll let you answer it. And um, just a disclaimer, COVID is exempt from all of these because nobody saw this shit coming. Um, and even if they would have and told us about it, we would have called them crazy. But um, first question is, what has been your most successful failure? And by that, I mean, at the time, it seemed like a devastating loss that you may not be able to recover from, but you were able to take life lessons from that that propelled you to greater success down the road. Yeah, um, I still have trouble with this because like, there, I don't have many regrets in life. Um, when I left, the CrossFit industry, I was involved in a partnership and I'll just say it with, with a, with a, with a guy, his name was Lance Breeden. He owns ultimate uh, CrossFit in Charlotte, very successful CrossFit. I have a lot of respect for him as a person and I have a lot of respect for what they do. Now there was a point where I really wanted more out of my role working for him. Um, we had a unique deal where, I would own one of every four memberships we added, right? But he had a real job and he had poured a lot of his like effort into um, this business. You know, I think he went through a divorce during, during it, all, all, a lot of stuff. So I was um, writing an email and, you know, I was colorful in this email of the things I would have done differently if I had the ownership of the business and pretty much just shoot my mouth off like a, like a immature 20 year old. And I sent it to him instead of the person I was sending it to. Oh yeah. And he was one of my like best friends and closest friends at the time. And, you know, we've been able to like catch up since and all that stuff, but I find the world works a lot better when you're very black and white with your communication. You know, if you think you could do better, just say it to the person. I, I, I find even speaking to my kids, 
they do well when you tell them exactly what you're asking them. So from a communication level, I don't sugarcoat things. You, you, but if you can get used to being okay and comfortable in uncomfortable conversations, I do think it helps a lot um, in relationships and also in, in the business world. Yeah, I like that quite a bit. And I agree with that um, because I know for me, and I struggled with that for a long time, but I know like somebody, if you ask somebody something and they say, no, I don't think I'll be able to do that. And this is why, then you're much better with that than saying, yeah, I can do that. And then not showing up or bagging or something along those lines, then, yeah. then it hurts your integrity, your relationship, the trust in the relationship all down the line. So I agree with that um, quite a bit. So what happened uh, with your guys' relationship? Did you guys have a falling out? Did you? You know, it's weird. When I hit send, I knew right away, like something in my body. I was like, I think I just sent that to him. So I literally shot him a text and just said, I sent you an email that obviously was not supposed to go to you. And um, this is going to require a pretty big book conversation after that. So uh, he took me out for lunch and we talked about it and we mutually were able to like part ways with a certain level of respect. It's not probably that he dis didn't disagree. He just had his whole heart in the business where, <clears throat> again, I made an immature statement, not considering like where he sat as that business owner and everything he had pulled in. And I was a 25 year old or whatever, 27 year old with a chip on my shoulder of what I could do, you know, being pretty naive to the, to the scenario. So we still have um, um, enough back and forths, but I think I would lie to say, I, 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 we have a respect, but there is a friendship loss based on me being a, an immature late 20 year old, you know? So, so now sitting in the ownership chair, what approach would you take if one of your trainers did the same thing to you? Um, oh, like it, it went down the exact same way or they took a smarter approach, the exact same way? Exact same way. Um, I actually, I don't know if it, it, it like it's a, a I kind of crave that kind of conversation. So I think I'd be okay with it if they followed up the way I did and said, listen, you know, I was out of line. I said this, it wasn't supposed to be for you, but I can't say I wouldn't have taken a similar approach where I wouldn't say, listen, we probably need to talk, <laughs> talk about the future. But I think I, I would hope that I could handle it as professionally as, as he did at, at the point. Um, yeah, okay. I guess you don't know. I guess you don't know. I, yeah. I guess the flip of the question I hope that was asked there is I hope anyone can come to me with a very difficult conversation and just say, hey, Brandon, like, I love what you've taught me, but I actually really want to go do my thing and I think I can actually be really good at it. I'd rather just say that. I'm cool with that. Like, gotcha. You know? Yeah, because um, I'm a big fan of the Tim Ferriss podcast and he had a guest on. He said, um, the level of happiness in your life is directly related to the number of un, uh, difficult conversations you're willing to have. Yeah. yeah. And I, I agree with that. So then my next question is, since you've been in the fitness industry full time, what has been the biggest surprise that you've had to deal with that you haven't seen coming? You know what, it, it's not that we don't see it coming, but I think educating the uneducated consumer is, is such a tricky thing. Um, <clears throat> it occupies 90% of the work day is how do you say this? And when I say an uneducated consumer, it is not in a rude way. It's, it's what I'm saying that these people have lives and jobs. They didn't come from an exercise science background. They like to come to your gym to see a smiling face to get the results of the workout. But when they log on a website and see an Orange Theories website, an F45s or a Metabolic, they see a kettlebell, 
they see a good looking trainer, they see some nice colors. Oh, look, the, the membership price is about the same. And this one's closer to my house. Like that's how people are making their decision on where they're going to try out. And that's getting your message clean and to the point is an ongoing battle. And it, and it always has to shift. I mean, right now, strength driven interval training is metabolics tagline why because our strength driven approach is quite a bit different to the high intensity interval training that is out there right now if strength became a big thing again we would have to think of how to distinguish ourselves again it's that constant reinventing yourself and and speaking to the consumer that that's a it is a challenge yeah I like that quite a bit. And that is a challenge trying to educate um, the consumer. And I think the beginning of that is you have to yourself make that mind shift from that trainer to put yourself in their shoes and kind of view fitness through their lens. And then what speaks and resonates with them. I agree with you a hundred percent. And then uh, my last question is where do you go for your personal and professional development? Um, working on that to, to, to be honest, um, I have a, I have a small group of friends. Um, I have a lot of acquaintances, I have a lot of good people in my life, but I do have a real good core group of guys that I could count on my hand, um, that I really look up to. They all have a small business kind of entrepreneurial type of background, but also too, they'll completely call me out on my shit and I'll do the same for them. So I'm I'm happy to have that. Um, I'm not against uh, sports psychologists, therapy or or, or, or any of that stuff. Um, I'd be completely open to it, finding the right person. I've experienced some of it in my past with some success. So, you know, I think if that's something that helps people, um, and weirdly enough, uh, I find a lot of comfort and growth in music. I, I, you know, I mean, I, 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 if there's one thing I like more than anything, it's music. I mean, if I could find a job in that, no offense guys, I'd probably gas metabolic tomorrow, but, um, (laughs) I love it. I find a lot of comfort. Uh, I enjoy what I miss m- most about COVID is live music. Yeah, it, it literally is what I miss uh, the most. So that's probably you know what you asked a very specific question. I gave you a very bullshit generic answer, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, there no, I, well, you know, the thing that I've come to realize is that, and and I learned this from one of my guests because I I I started meditating. Oh, about two years ago. And like everything else, when I first started, it sucked. I sucked at it. Um, And through just constant practice, I've gotten much better. And it just helps me in so many ways that I used to always push, oh, you got to meditate, you got to meditate. And then one of the guests said, well, I, you know, meditation is just a tool. It can be another tool in your toolbox. It's not the tool. It's a tool, you know, and and so it's whatever gets you kind of like uh, Tim Ferriss said, having tea with Mara, meaning if there's something that's bothering you, like when I'm in a bad mood, it's usually because something's eating at me. So I need to figure out what that is. And I need to sit down and have a heart to heart with it, right? To figure out what I need to do with it, what decisions I need to make to uh, move forward and be okay with myself, right? So anything or any methodology that helps you achieve that goal is equal, right? It doesn't matter if it's meditation or music. You know, I remember when I was going through uh, my divorce, I started running. And I realized the reason I like running is because it was meditative. You know, it was the one time that where I, you know, I was able to just kind of think and have tea with some of those things, so to speak. So, I mean, it sounds like music is your method for that. So more power. Yeah, to walk, hike. Um, the other thing too, and the, um, 
I would say is, uh, I'll say this two different ways because like we're in a weird spot where <clears throat> um, it's almost like the, uh, some, of the, some of the good side of all of this is almost in a weird way being overplayed right now. It's almost like empathy is a brand that you could sell now in a weird way. <laughs> but on the flip of that, be, I used to take everything myself, everything. So if it's just as simple as having that small group of guys to just chat with um, time to time, like you said, I don't think there's a, there's a perfect answer, but um, bottling it all up is not, is not a good thing. <laughs> oh, no, and, and, and be honest with you, there's probably a lot of people struggling with that because of COVID. Yeah. So, all right, so tell people where they can find more information about you, about Met Met Metabolic, if they want more information, if they want a franchise, all that good stuff. Yeah, so I've, um, as far as social media goes, I kind of stick to LinkedIn. Um, I found it a bit of a distraction a few years ago, and, and, and even though I manage a lot of our corporate voice, um, you know, you could find me on a personal level or on a professional level on, link on LinkedIn. As far as the brand goes, you know, I, I'm probably the least sales pitchy guy you'll ever find in our organization. I really love what we do. Um, I love the staff, the people I get to work with on a daily basis. And I think what we do, I think we do it real well. So if you want to learn more about that, our website, metabolic.com, uh, tells our story pretty well. And we are, uh, we're very active on uh, social media. So Instagram, just at Metabolic, uh, will give you all the information and insight to our, our really badass culture that I'm, I'm really proud of and, and happy to be associated with. All right. Thanks, Brandon. All those links will be in the show notes. Just go to trainergym.net and click on this episode of the podcast and all the links to get in touch with Brandon, find more about Metabolic. If you're interested in opening a franchise, you can get all of the information there. So Brandon, thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it too. It was a good time. Yeah. Yeah. And I would like to reserve the, the right to, to have you on. And, and if I'm ever in the Charlotte area, I will definitely stop by and and say hi you can maybe we can take a trip over to that coffee shop and you can introduce <clears throat> me to everybody and we can sit down and chat i would love both <laughs> <laughs> all right man well have a good day and thanks again for you taking too. the time i appreciate it all right take care